So you can see just how busy Professor Eggman has been in South Australia, talking to the hundreds of people who are involved in South Australian government and agencies and organisations across the whole spectrum of road safety. We have 10 more minutes before we'll conclude this evening. I'd welcome a couple of questions. Uh, we have a microphone here in the middle. If someone would like to ask a question, uh, we can put it to Professor Eggman. I'm Thank standing you. here, so I'll speak. Um, I liked the idea about the cycling and keeping the CBD separated uh, from cars with bikes. What I don't agree with is I've heard of uh, trials in Scandinavia where they simplify the road network so there aren't so many signs, aren't so many speed restrictions and allow people to use their intelligence. And that seemed to work better than keep enforcing more and more laws and regulations on them to let people use their own brain. And that's why I don't agree with you about the right-hand turn either, because there's nothing more frustrating than sitting with an open carriageway coming at you and a red right-hand turn light that won't let you go. So. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that as a comment. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> see you. the question, no, but uh, that's okay, okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Next question. <laughs> I, um, I wonder about uh, some separation in our uh, road traffic. We hear about trying to get more people onto bikes, etc. I wonder about trying to um, get less trucks on the road. Um, let's and uh, we'll even separate the freight from uh, our public transport. Um, your comments on that? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't touch at all on the whole heavy goods vehicles problems. You're right. And basically, if if you can make that uh, that industry more efficient, that will be helpful. And otherwise, I would suggest to indicate what kind of, what, what roads you would like to see these trucks. And that does mean that uh, other roads uh, are not going to carry these trucks. And the other element I have is using traffic management techniques in order to reduce um, negative consequences on environmental matters or capacity or safety to make truck driving more smoothly in the city. And perhaps that can be a lower speed, perhaps that should be a higher speed, that's not, not my, my point, but to make it smoother. But you're right, I'm going to, to, to touch upon this item about how to deal with truck traffic in this city and how to get to reduce the exposure and to reduce the consequence of crashes with trucks. Thank you. Next question, please. Professor, I was listening to your comments on driver training as far as the age of our learner drivers, what age do you feel would be a safe age to start teaching driving? Uh, well, it's, it's not a matter of right or wrong in this case. It's more a matter of what's, what is the consequence of taking this decision compared with the consequence of that decision. So I don't believe we can answer this in right or wrong. Um, what we learned, and then I, I can say that, what we learned uh, the last decade using uh, MRI scans, um, understanding uh, the performance of, 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 of young people, that they are mature only when they are 25. So think about that. And it's critical, and you know, perhaps <laughs> strange, but it's critical, because at a later age, you develop skills to judge good and bad. Uh, to, to control uh, your, your responses to, uh, to the outside world. So it is, it is critical. Um, when you talk about what is a good age, then it's, it's, it's more a matter of what, what do you believe, what's acceptable, what are the consequences of a certain age. I give you one example, not for my country, but for another country. Do you know that in a country like Sweden, young kids are not uh, aiming for the driver licensing at 18, but delay that a little bit. And do you know why? Because of the cost consequences for them. They have to pay the driver education. You have a cheap driver education here, by the way. Um, uh, and they, they are afraid for the consequences and they wait for a while. But the question then, of course, is um, what is their alternative? Do you have good public transport? Do you have bicycling? Or do you need to rely on your parents? Um, so. The, I'm afraid to give a, a complicated answer to a very simple question. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Donald Beard, uh, Road Safety at the College of Surgeons. Um, 
thank you for coming tonight and talking to us with several very good suggestions. <coughs> However, there's no single uh, cause of a crash and there's no single implementation. Every time there's uh, a rise in the crashes, uh, government tends to go overboard and uh, attack one single system. Um, education is important, but it's very difficult to get an, uh, into the education hour because they're getting crammed full of more and more activities. So not easy. Uh, not, nothing's easy. Uh, it's very difficult to modify human behaviour psychologically. Very, very difficult. Uh, the rest Would you like to comment on that? I, I agree. And although it's difficult, we have to give it a try. And we were successful in the past already. Uh, so it's not uh, a fight we cannot win. But we have to change the environment, in my opinion. And that's happening outside the roads when it comes to safety. Have a look on how mining companies are, are running their business. Have a look on how oil, oil companies are running their business. We have to learn from that, from them. And uh, given, given a safer environment, I do believe that we can uh, use education and enforcement to bring them on the right track. But I agree, it's not an easy task at all. Thank you very much. Next question. Margaret Dingle, People for Public Transport. Uh, Professor Wegman gave some excellent ideas. I just happened to notice as the Minister was speaking and later Professor, Professor Wegman that Holland and which, uh, the Netherlands, which has a much lower road toll, um, is um, much more favourable to public transport and cycling. I've been to central Amsterdam and if you don't get on a bike you can catch a tram very quickly. Um, and I think um, the, the, the availability of alternatives to driving your own car is, is important and uh, it's important that if people can cycle, are not going to be knocked off their bikes by cars, the, the more of them will ride their bikes. And also thinking about young people, if 16-year-olds if want to go out on a date and they don't, can't get a licence till 18, they need some alternative transport that's safe. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Next question, thanks. Professor, did you work out why those annoying Victorians are safer than us? <laughs> Thank you, Cassie. Yeah. Um, oh, these are, of course, better people, whatever. No. Um, um, it, it, it's a good question, and, and perhaps I have to pay some more time on that. Uh, what, what I know... Uh, that is, um, in the past, they paid a lot of attention to uh, police activities, perhaps you know that. Uh, so the pressure from the police was famous all over the world, and there, there are not too many countries where they have that. Uh, the quality of the road, uh, I'm, I'm not fully aware of that, but somebody tried to believe me that these are better roads. But it's also a cultural element I learned. Uh, over time, they changed their behavior. Uh, somewhat, and I, I was told, I've, 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 uh, it's up to you, I was told that here in South Australia you can easily violate a speed limit and you do that exactly the same in Victoria and you have a problem. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Um, Heather of Prospect Bicycle User Group. Um, one of your notes was revisit standards, guidelines and manuals. Um, and I have no, I'll lead up to a question, but during my cycling advocacy, I've noticed a problem. For example, commuter and freight route Churchill Road, which is near the CBD, is currently being narrowed until cyclists will be overtaken by trucks by less than one metre. Now, we've got, a, we've got several documents that say leave a minimum of one metre when overtaking a cyclist, be it a, a state cycling safety campaign, a federal cycling safety campaign, the driver's handbook and Ost Roads, and, and yet Prospect Council and DTI have approved something which doesn't fit with these guidelines. How can we, it's no point having guidelines if we can't have them enforced. I mean, how do we get the governments 
to actually enforce the guidelines. I'm really concerned, you know, for safety cycling, uh, safe cycling. Perhaps I'm not the best person to answer that question. Um, but but you, you, you point to a good, a, a complicated item. You have uh, lanes, and I've seen those cycle lanes where parks, uh, cars are simply parked. And you saw the example of this cyclist cycling in front of me, and he, he had to move towards the towards the, the lane for cars. And that's, that's dangerous because you have to look all the time where, where are these cars. So you are right, and the question is how to come from, from this observation to a safer situation. And um, I don't have the answer yet, but, but well, I, I thought, I saw, uh, that's interesting for, for, for people like you with, with t-shirts like that. Can, can, we bring, can we bring cyclists to the back streets sometimes? Uh, sometimes, but the thing is that if you're, say, a commuter cyclist who has to do 10 to 20 k's, you don't want to go through slower back streets to get to work, or you'll think twice about cycling. And the other thing is that I do cycle on a bike direct route, but I need to get to Arterial Churchill Road and Arterial Prospect Road to get to shops and businesses and the post office. I mean, they are not on the residential streets, which are labelled bike direct routes. Okay. okay, look, thank you for raising those important points. Two more questions, and they'll have to be quick. I've got a, oh, good evening. I've got a more detail about what I've... Could you speak up a bit? Sorry, I've got a more detail in writing here, but we're trying to make it brief, but the main north-south corridor, uh, along South Road between Henley Beach Road and Regency Road. Um, the traffic moves very slowly around about 4 p.m. and 9 a.m. in the morning. And on, earlier you mentioned about uh, no right turns away from light control intersections. If um, there was a policy along there that you didn't, weren't able to turn right unless you turned right at a light control uh, intersection, uh, it would allow the traffic to flow <coughs> along the corridor a lot quicker and uh, reduce the speed limit to 40 k's, so then when cars turn left, you reduce uh, your braking from 40 k's to, say, 15 k's, rather than 60 k's to um, 15 k's for a vehicle turning left. And that's basically it. If you wanted to read more, I've got it here. Thank you very much. Thank you for those suggestions. It's a complex corridor, that area. Next one. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, my name's Lambert. Um, I'm also a Dutchman uh, background. Um, I'm uh, talking about, so I'm actually on the road quite a bit and uh, um, with, I'm in, involved with transport industry at the present moment and uh, with uh, deliveries or so, um, I uh, see a lot of uh, things like where sometimes there's uh, too many intersections on particular roads and you've got stopping and starting too many times. Uh, so that causes a bit of frustration. Um, like with the work I do, um, I find I go faster so by uh, doing a lot of left-hand turns and avoid right-hand turns at uh, major, um, major roads, arterials. But um, the most, I was wondering so if there's any, um, any thoughts about the possibility of uh, uh, decreasing some of the intersections and um, cutting out some of the uh, side streets uh, uh, access uh, to those major roads. Thank you. Did you get that, that last question? Um, it, it comes to access control. Is that, is that what you're asking for? So, so what, what my, my major, major observation here is that, that the system, as I observed it, is a complicated system. So you don't help the drivers a lot. Uh, you don't give him a lot, her, a lot of guidance. In, 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 in the design, you leave it to the drivers, and um, that makes it sometimes very complicated. So we are, we are not talking yet about the uh, Britannia roundabout, uh, but that's a famous example here, uh, where it's very complicated. And, and what we have to think about is, can we design the roads and, uh, and, and, and use planning for that purpose as well, to make it somewhat easier for the drivers? And, and, and that's, that's, in my opinion, the direction we have to look for. And again, I, I, if you talk about situation A or B, perhaps I can have an opinion if I visit it, but, but in general, I don't think it's wise to, to comment on that. 
Okay, thank you yeah. so much. What one more? Once again, Professor Bigman, thank you so much for all your work and your communication with us tonight, and we'll look forward to your report, which will go into some of this in more detail. Let's uh, show Professor Bigman our appreciation. Thank you. Now, we're just about at the end of our evening. I failed to welcome Liz Ho, but I will now like to invite Liz up to make a formal farewell from the Hawke Centre. And I'd like to, while I'm here, particularly recognise the work of Denise Madigan and Joe Hay and Pauline Tuft and Lydia Jawaski, who worked very hard on this residency and on putting this event together tonight. This is going to be very, very brief. Um, we've had a wonderful evening. Uh, part of our role at the Hawke Centre, um, particularly for this lecture, is to work with thinkers in residence to make the final recommendations of the thinker as accessible as possible in a live situation. I think we all agree having that connection is very, very valuable. Our role in the Hawke Centre is to encourage people to think, connect and act. And I'd like to bring you right back to the, one of the first things that Fred said tonight. He said, it is not necessary to live with the problem. And I see that as a challenge to complacency. I think he's shown the importance, um, in his words, of sustainable mobility, the complexities of it, but also the simplicities of it. He's presented it in a way that is highly accessible to people who are not engineers, uh, who are not necessarily expert. And personally, uh, I feel very enriched uh, by what he's said tonight. I'm quite proud at the moment of the fact that I managed to buy my son a reasonably modern car. So I feel good about that, as I'm sure a few people do in the audience. But I, I have picked up in particular the point about our driving age. The fact that we sometimes see young people as being far more mature than they are. And I think he's really given us a message there. And I'd like to just finish by pointing out that we have the benefit here of a comprehensive expert view uh, one that can take us forward, that will take us forward in a way that can remove tragedy, remove terrible harm to many families in South Australia. And I would like to thank Fred on behalf of everybody here tonight for a wonderfully enriching talk. Thank you. Two final notes. I forgot to thank Jeremy Woolley for his hard work as well. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been fantastic working with you as a catalyst all through, all through the process of this residency. You can see we've got a lot of events coming up. We'd love to see you at those events. I mentioned at the uh, talk from Johan Roos the other day that it's one of my dreams to see more young people in the audience. If you look around, you'll see we don't have that many young people in the audience. I think it's essential to attract young people to these events, and I would ask you to think about bringing your children or your grandchildren or nieces or nephews or the neighbours' kids along with you next time you come to a Thinkers in Residence event. Thank you so much, everyone, and drive safely. Thank you.